Nice. Hi, Drew. I've got the webinar up. Uh, whenever you're ready, let me know. Hey, Tess, you find it all? Oh, let me see. Huh? Might need some uh, chain oil. There's some chain oil on the shell there, I think. Yeah. Yes. Um, if I send you a link, can you try to z connect on your phone? You want me to text it to you? See what comes up. Hello, everybody. We're getting set up for Drew's webinar. Um, I'm going to mute my line so I can make some calls. So glad to have you all here.
Hey, Matt. Hello, Drew. How are you? Good, good. I, I've got it uh, live right now, so people are starting to sign on, which is great. Good to oh, see cool. you. <laughs> good to see you as well. I'm, I'm, uh, how you been? Everybody, everybody doing, good? Doing, doing, doing well, doing all right. I would, I would like to be outside, but I have a neighbor who religiously, when I say religiously, mows his yard at this time every Saturday. It's like it's, clockwork. <laughs> yeah, his grass can be dust. And and I and that's what he's he's gonna wash his car every Friday, rain or shine. He's gonna blow leaves even as leaves are falling on his lawn, and he's gonna cut his grass religiously. So that's um a lot of noise, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so hopefully it's a little quieter in here. I've, I have a feeling you and I both train our lawns to do the same thing, which is grow a lot of broadleaf, gra non-grasses, yes. and if, let it be taken over with periwinkle and phlox. <laughs> yes, I, actually, um, my, my lawn was beautifully clover last year, and then the drought um, killed a, a lot of it. It's coming back. Um, oh, it's it's seeds. That's, that, that's my dominant grass type is clover. I love it. Yeah. And in the yeah, spring, I, it's a carpet of vi blue violets and uh, yellow clover uh, flowers. Yes, yes, absolutely. This is a good book that I just um, ordered a little while. I got it a while ago. It's called Birds, Myth, Lore, and Legend. Um, and it, it's, I think the authors are British, but it's, it's got a lot of, it's, it's pretty generalized, but it's pretty good stuff. What's that? I'm going to put this into the uh, um, into the notes here so everybody can see it. It's called okay. Birds. Birds, Myth, Lore, and Legend. Lore and Legend. And who's the author? By the Rachel. authors are uh, Chad, C-H-A-D-D, and Taylor, T-A-Y-L-O-R. Chad Taylor, okay. Ch Chad and Taylor. It's two authors. It's a Chad and, Chad and Taylor, okay. Yeah. Rachel Warren, Chad, and Marianne Taylor. Awesome. I got that in the notes for everybody. Cool. Let's see here. Uh, and Drew, do you want me to bring up your presentation or do you want to share your screen? Um, you should do it because I'm coming from my phone. Um, okay, I don't have my lap. I don't have my good laptop with the camera on it. That's still in my office at school. Um, All right, I'm going to. I'm going to try this and see um, what happens and here. Hit F5 for the. All right. I think everybody can see that. So. Yeah. And, and once you hit that opening slide, it should start rolling. Okay. And, um, and I'm, I'm kind of going to, this is going to kind of be a ramble um, yeah. like a walk would be. So I'll try to um, have everybody understand how we're going to do that. And that these are, with the exception of some of the bird pictures, you know, they're all Montpelier scenes. Um, I noticed that. They're beautiful. And, I, you know, I want us to do like we did the last time, so kind of, um, in, our, uh, in our virtual woods walk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, this will be a combination of the talk that I did. When was that? Back in that was March? Yeah, end of February, beginning of March. Yeah, it's yeah. right before all this happened. Yeah, it'll be a combination of that talk and our woods walk. Okay, that sounds great. That sounds great. Yeah, I I am um I was I was looking actually for um another reference that I had, but really I'm I'm gonna you know, what I, what I want to do is um, sort of give people the feeling for, uh, I don't know, the, not the random nature of the discussion, um, mm -hmm. but on some of our rambles, how anything can turn into anything else. And so, you know, I had these slides, um, I sort of had an order to them. But then I sort of just jumbled them all up. They're almost like cards tossed into the air. So <laughs> it'll it'll be a little. You'll you'll be my pathfinder at times. Absolutely, um, I'd love it. I love it. 
and 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 I will follow you as well. So on any given slide, feel free to, you know, have at it. It's just as much your presentation as it is mine. So, yeah, some shared experiences, which is awesome, Drew. Yeah. I'm I'm working on the dock. Um, I've been working really hard up at Sunset Camp. So, um, um, after I finish here, I'll probably head up and try. It was a it's a kit. It's a pier, really. It's not okay. even a floating dock. So I'm going to go and try to um, manhandle the first part of that into place. Mm -hmm. And um, yesterday I spent about four hours up there working. The day before that, I spent about six. The day before that, I spent about eight. Oh, that um, sounds awesome. And it's some really hard labor. Getting the dock set. So. That's gonna that's gonna be an incredible space. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. How's the Jeep work going? It it's going fine. Tess just got back home, so we're gonna start in on that because I didn't do any work when she was gone because she wants to be the lead on that. I'm I'm her Sue mechanic, so uh, <laughs> but she she's got to um, uh, get the um, replace the brake lines, uh, do the valve cover gasket, and I'm thinking we're gonna need to do the. Um, one of the axles, the CV joint inside the, the um, knuckle is knocking yeah. and make a sharp left turn. So I think we've got to pull the axle apart and get that uh, replaced. Wow. And once that's done, I think it's good. She, we, she already tore apart the whole steering column and we got ordered a junkyard steering column from North Carolina and that went in. So that's, it's drivable now, which is great. Wow. Wow. So, I, I envy that. That's pretty cool that you guys are doing that. It is fun. So it's a, it's a dream come true to, you know, 20 years, you know, working on the car, I'd always be like, Hey, anybody want to help me on the car and crickets, but now it, it, it came around. So. Wow. Okay. So there is help. It looks like Kat just signed on. Hello, Kat. I Hi, see Kat. you're here. Awesome. <laughs> but problem is I don't, with DMV closed, I don't know how to get the, um, get this thing titled we're gonna to have to see how that works so yeah i um i used to help my father out a lot but i you know now just having the if i had the time and of course i have the time now to do things like you know pull the wheels to put on brakes on this 86 bronco and that kind of thing but when i you know i it, it cranked work right up when I put this new battery in it, but then it wouldn't move. I mean, it was very hard to move. Hmm. How do you And mean? Um, at first I thought the drums, the, the brakes were just frozen. Okay. But it turned out that the emergency brake line had corroded. Oh, so it was just stuck solid. Yeah. Okay. So okay. I had to, and then I, you know, the alternator somehow, the, the third day that I cranked it, the alternator shorted. It's all stuff that was waiting, so. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's, I'm glad that um, that's being taken care of, and I wish that I had your skill and patience. It's, yeah, it's, um, I don't have any patience, and uh, <laughs> so, so it, but I'm, I'm, I'm putting all that aside for Tess, because it's her, it's her game, but the nice <laughs> thing is having a vehicle like that that you can take apart and then put all the parts inside it and just walk away from it because it's not your daily driver. It's full yeah. panic would be set in when it used to be my daily driver I had to do that with, so. Is, um, is Tess gonna paint it any sort of weird color? She, so far, she's gonna keep it the, um, the factory uh, color. It's a white color, which she likes for going, you know, the okay. heat. And uh, she's hoping, hoping she can get it fixed up. She wants to do some work on some, um, volunteer like living at some communes out west like uh farm communes because nothing's really going on with the internship she was hoping to get yeah is everything's kind of shut down so we're gonna we're gonna see if we can get her jeep running and then she'll be able to do that cool <clears throat> All right. 
see. Yeah, people are starting to file in, Drew. We've got 26 okay. folks. Cool. Um, the, uh, Rosemary Martin Jones says hello to you, Drew. Yeah, hey, Rosemary, how are you? Yeah, she's a good friend. She's a, an environmental educator and um, fellow Clemson employee down um, near Columbia. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, see, we have a, a lot of folks um, that have been to our talks before, Peggy and uh, Rhonda, Vicki in Virginia, Dean, Ellen Wessel, all kinds of friends. Hank and Mary and Mix. Well, also, Drew, I'm, as normal, I'm recording this on YouTube. So if anybody misses this or has to skip out early, I can, we can always send them that, uh, that link. Okay, sounds good. Well, here on the deck at the archeology span lab, the breeze is cranking through this space. It's absolutely beautiful out here. <laughs> yeah, it, it, looks, it looks really good. It's not too bad here today. I think we're, we, pro we probably made it into the 80s. Okay, um, okay. We're, we're high 70s. And actually, the property is open now, Drew. We, we've got the trails oh, open. It? So none of the inside spaces, none of the buildings are open. But we've got all the trails uh, back open. We just opened those uh, yesterday. Oh, cool. So we're using it, basically treating the, the, um, the property like a state park. So Cat, uh, who's on here, will appreciate that. So but it's so it, it's two o'clock, Drew. So we could go ahead and... Uh, get started into the um, thick of this. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce you, Drew. I'm, I'm uh, Matt Reeves. I'm director of archeology span here at Montpelier and I'm gonna be Drew's host today. And we're really thrilled to have uh, Dr. Drew Lanham back who is a, uh, uh, an ornithologist, a wildlife biologist at Clemson and is also our um, uh, uh, resident ecologist here at Montpelier. And, uh, yeah, Drew and I have been partnering on a number of projects here, especially the historic ecology and studying the historic landscape here at Montpelier. So Drew is going to take us on a virtual bird walk, which I, I'm so excited <laughs> about. So and I, um, I, I, I think we would have, we, we still would not have been able to pass this under the threshold of COVID, Drew, because we we can't convene any groups at Montpelier yeah. and based on the number, let's see, we've got 38 people. So that governor Northam would have come out and uh, said, what are you all doing? <laughs> so, so it's well, good. We have this virtual. <laughs> yeah. With both of us being scientists, Matt, I know we both believe in the science. Absolutely. Right? And, um, and so we're, we're doing the right thing. And the two of us, um, I know we like being together, but we also like being healthy. So, and we want everyone who's attending this virtual ramble um, to be healthy as well. So we're glad that that the 38 and hopefully more are are out there. Absolutely, absolutely. Everyone, yeah, everyone is hopefully now 40. Social distancing and and staying healthy. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna kick this thing. We just gotta follow science, which is it's That's one it. one silver lining of this is the, the benefits of science to to society. So really, Matt, what I'd, I'd like to do today, and, and this is going to be a different kind of bird walk, obviously. I mean, already it is because we're virtual. We can't be out there watching birds, listening to birds, um, seeing some of the, the wildflowers that are still lingering on the forest floor there, um, and experiencing the, the history um, tangibly on the ground there um, in, in the Virginia Piedmont. So it's, this is going to be more of a, of a, of a bird ramble. Mm -hmm. um, and as you and I do, I think that, that probably um, anyone who's walked with us understands how long it takes us to go just a few feet. <laughs> we, we, we end up, um, 
you, you know, um, after an hour, we've gone maybe a hundred yards. Um, <laughs> but um, this this will be sort of like that. But um, I hope that what we're able to do is have conversations as we go along, and that if if people will ask questions. Um, I love questions, and I always, I promise, I always will have a response. Even if it's a shoulder shrug, I always have a response. And for your questions, um, the easiest way to do this, if you all type it into the chat box, we, I'll, I'll be on the lookout for these questions, and I'll shout them out to you, Drew, as they, as they come in. Cool. Sounds good. And, and for, the, for the audience, you can either do the questions to everyone, you can draw the drop down. There's a drop down menu where you can either do to all panelists and attendees, or just to uh, to the to us, you know, Drew and I, the, the uh, panelists. So, Drew, whenever you want me to bring up the uh, your PowerPoint, I could share screens and start doing that. Yeah, yeah, you can go ahead. You can go ahead and start that, Matt. And um, okay. and and as we sort of do when we are gathered at the visitor center, usually. Um, we sort of gather around and we're talking and gabbing and then all of a sudden the bird confusion <laughs> <laughs> um, takes over and um, but before all of that that bird confusion um, takes over again welcome to um, to James Madison's Montpelier here we are and um, and and we're seeing a different view of James Madison's Montpelier even right here. And purposefully, all of you have obviously driven up through the great, uh, down the great avenue, at least we'll pretend that you have. Um, but we were looking at a different viewpoint there, right? And we were looking through the South Yard, right, Matt? Yeah, that's looking through the South Yard about uh, three years ago when we, were, we had just finished the duplexes and we were still doing archeology span on the, uh, the kitchen. We were getting ready to build the smokehouses next. Yeah, so that that viewpoint really um, is 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 sort of what is that's the lens that we are going to look through Montpelier, and and we're obviously going to be thinking about the natural history um, because really um, the story of plantation ecology is is what we'll call this. And and Matt, I, I need to talk to you about that because that's a course that the two of us are going to teach together. Uh -huh. Oh, I, I would love that. That would be an absolute thrill. That'd be amazing. So any of you who are interested in this, we're going to offer, um, um, this is breaking news to Matt. Um, <laughs> we're going to offer this at some point um, through through Montpelier um, and offer this class um, on plantation ecology because it's important. It's, it's really a walk through bitter history. Um, and I say it's a haunted landscape where people were bound to land where pieces lie underground, where shards of lives lived as property, bones and bottles, vultures, scavenging ghosts. Um, we may walk through a graveyard with periwinkle, evergreen grave grass that had become a dump site of the royally rich past enslavement, but to people who really didn't care about demeaning the dead. And so in the midst of, of beauty, of of this place and so much bad that was and some that still persist, I want us to think about this history and this 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 distinction of, of color. I want us to think about these people um, who are shadowed now on the museum walls, but who who live there. And so as we as we walk around Montpelier, as we carry our field glasses, our binoculars, to focus in on birds, I also want us to begin to think about these four generations of enslavers. I want us to think about um, how this natural history of this place and growing tobacco led to changes in the land, how trees can begin to tell us stories. Here we see this legacy line of tulip poplars, and you see Matt there with technology that shows him um, in palisade form, this wonderful landscape. And this is a winter landscape that you see here, but pretty soon, right, we're gonna be underneath a canopy that's full of leaves, 
that's full of bird song. And so I want us to think about how all this fits together, ecology, culture, agriculture. I want us to think about how we communicate the complexity of all of this. I'm personally overflowing in the contradictions that confound my own identity, race, and connections to place. And you see Matt there with his arms outstretched, <laughs> and, and there he is next to what most of us would think, right? We walk down through this landscape, and you say, oh, there's a creek. But Matt, the science tells us what about that place? This was, it, it, it's, it's a creek today, but it was, it was, it's a ditch, an agricultural ditch that was dug by enslaved laborers over 200 years ago to allow this bottom land, land to be worked as to a tobacco field. So what I loved about what you, point, what you realized when you were looking at the woodland here that you know, has grown up since the 1840s when the field was abandoned, you were like, Matt, this, this field never floods. There's no clumps of leaves around uh, bushes. You, there's no sycamore trees. This continues to be a well-drained bottomland that could be turned back into agriculture, you know, some 200 years after these ditches have been dug and maintained. So, uh, th and there's and there's Matt, and and that um, I get I have as much fun watching for wildlife as I have watching my friend Matt out yeah. in the woods because <laughs> he has such a passion for this place. So, as we walk now down towards this bottomland and this 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 creek once ditch, um, one of the things that, that will be very different this time of year is that you could probably almost not see Matt um, because in this he's got on this wonderful green Carhartt jacket here, which would blend in with all the greenery. But as we are walking through woodlands, as we're doing this plantation ecology, I want us to be cognizant of every step. I want us to, to, to think about um, where we are, and as we listen to birds, as we come across birds every now and again, I want us to think about what the land was. So the goldfinch that you see here, the American goldfinch, is a bird that many of you are probably familiar with, and it's a bird um, that would have been around during the time of, um, of Madison's Montpelier, but this would have been a bird and probably a bird that would have been actually in some of these fields that existed along, along these bottomlands. Remember, the forest wasn't there then, not an intact forest that we see now. So we're thinking about constant change. Um, this bird back then probably would have been called a wild canary. Um, some folks probably would have just called it a yellow bird. Um, it's a bird that nests late in the season, a bird that's going to take advantage of things like bull thistle. You may even see goldfinches um, in fallow fields and on roadsides past the season when most birds are nesting, and you'll see them pulling the fibers from the thistle to line their nests. They'll eat some of those seeds, but they will also line their nests with this thistle and they'll line their nests so tightly that those nests will hold water. Mm -hmm. And so I would imagine that for a very long time, um, native peoples, um, peoples who depended on the land like enslaved peoples would have noticed these nests and perhaps thought about using some of the same materials um, to line clothing, um, or to use in other ways that benefit, benefited them. So this is the American goldfinch, a wild canary, a bird that certainly would have been familiar on Montpelier at the time of enslavement. Drew, I love what you have, we, we, we've been, when we've been out in the woods and various conversations we've had, you've pointed out that, you know, what, you, what inspired you as a naturalist was observations that you made growing up on a on 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 your ancestral farmland and that's mm -hmm. what really carried you through into the field of ecology and when you think about um uh you know enslaved laborers who would have known this landscape so well you don't think about them as naturalists you think about the work they did but that would have been combined with their knowledge of the soils the 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 ravines the um the places that were out of sight out of mind of 
the um of the owners the overseers that yeah. would have been all their world that they would have known very intimately yeah matt it, it's i mean if we think now about what what agriculture is um and a lot of us think of be all things um, a farmer has to be not only um, a naturalist but i'm familiar with animal husbandry with botany um, a meteorologist a geologist a soil scientist um, all of these things and more is what someone who tends the land has to be and so yeah as we walk this land let's not just think of enslaved peoples as those who were sent out to do tasks without knowledge. Um, these are people who had intense and immense knowledge of plan and of place, of the wild things, the plants, the animals that existed on land. And oftentimes, and you'll hear us say, um, as we see this red-tailed hawk here, what some people, my grandmother would have called a chicken hawk, mm. but a red-tailed hawk, um, a bird that also would have been around at, at the time of enslavement. Um, you'll hear us, Matt, use the word enslavement, and, and some people are perplexed and as to why we do that. And part of the reason that we do that is to help people understand that um, people were enslaved. They weren't slaves unto themselves. And so um, that's a matter, it may sound like a slight matter of two words, but it makes all the difference that people who are enslaved had minds of their own, had intelligence, had skills, um, but they fell victim to a system of enslavement. And so it's easy for a lot of people to think that all that a slave did was to carry out tasks um, using the knowledge of others. These are people who had knowledge. These are people who exercised really sort of science on the ground and because their lives depended on it. Um, the crops, if they grew well in one place and didn't grow well in another place, then they ultimately wanted to, to be most productive in those places where that made their lives the easiest. That's, that's sort of what humanity has been about in terms of our survival. So here's a bird that um, that a lot of people would not have wanted to see coming because it could have meant that the chickens that they had in their yard um, could have fallen prey to red-tailed hawks. Even though um, red-tailed hawks take relatively few chickens, we're probably thinking more about accipiters um, that would do that. Back in um, Madison's day, these would have been birds that would have been heavily persecuted because raptors and predatory birds have always been seen sort of as competitors to humans. And um, in those cases, when those predators are taking potential food away from humans like chickens or geese or, or those sorts of things, poultry, then they're going to be heavily persecuted. And in some cases, um, people um, had jobs, for example, of keeping a chicken, chicken yard and so um, did not always, frequently did not have the use of firearms. So sometimes would actu actually set traps for hawks um, on tops of poles, what we call pole sets, um, to capture them, but would, would also sometimes try to poison um, some of these birds. So raptors have been under a great deal of persecution for a very, very long time. So as we walk along out of the South Yard past the visitor center, and Matt, there's a great feel there um, where you've done some recent archeological work um, and probably the last site of some of um, the enslaved housing on the site. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that is, it's the, the field, you're, you're talking about the field just below the visitor center. Yeah. And that's what we're today calling uh, the home farm. It's what we believe it was called. Uh, and, you know, in documents, it's referred to this and probably what the uh, um, enslaved community referred to it as is the home farm for 
Montpelier, which is the main farm complex for the plantation. And what we found through archaeology is, is this um, uh, 45 acre area contained over two dozen buildings. There's uh, at least six residences, homes for the enslaved community. There's the overseer's house, there's a blacksmith, a stable. Um, we found a, uh, um, a, 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 a granary that was also combined with a threshing barn, um, all kinds of work buildings. And this was command central. And what's really amazing about this space is it was used up until the time that Dolly Madison sold the property in 1844. And then at that point, it was abandoned and never touched again. It was has never been plowed. Um, the period where it could have been plowed, and this really gets to w what happens at Montpelier is after 1844, you go from a population of over 100 enslaved laborers, a community sized over 100 individuals, down to about 25 with Dolly selling the land and the, uh, the community. And the area that becomes the new farm complex after this sale is where I am right now in the area where what we call the Constitutional Village, where Lewis Hall is, the farm pond is located. And what happens to the field below the visitor center is it's basically, it's left as pasture. It never grows up grows back into woods because it's 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 kept it, you know the, the field is um kept hayed and then during the dupont years today where the visitor center is that becomes that's the duponts have that um uh, area built up for their swimming pool and tennis court complex and basically you've got these fields out below that area that have been allowed to lay fallow for you know a, a century and a half and so um, the first time you came to visit Drew and you heard that, your your eyes nearly popped out of your head because your 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 thoughts were on, you know, what could be in that 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 thatch that's out there, that root thatch of the of that grassland that's out there. And we know that we've got um, we've got uh, archaeological sites, and those archaeology sites. Uh, are ones that we're um, studying now. We just got a, a National Endowment for the Humanities grant to look at the home farm. And um, uh, so, Drew, Drew, are you, um, it looks like you're a little bit frozen up. Are you, are you hearing me okay? That, that, I, cert I certainly am. And I wanted to answer a question. We had a question of, is this a virtual bird walk or a history lesson? It's both. They're inseparable for this. And let me tell you how. As Matt um, was talking about the home farm in that area, when we do bird walks um, on this area, we don't just look at the birds. We take our glasses down and we look around us because this blue grosbeak beak that's here, for example, even though this isn't a picture of a blue grosbeak beak from the home farm, this is a picture of a bird Drew, we lost your speech for the last 15 seconds. Yeah, that I think Drew's having some technical problems with his uh, internet. I'm gonna wait for Drew to catch up. I go up to, okay, can you? Oh, okay, that looks like you're back, Drew. We lost, yeah. we lost your talk about the gross, gross beak. Okay, I'm back. Did you hear my, well, I was responding to a question that popped up. Did you guys yes. hear that, that question? We, we, heard, we heard the very beginning of that where you were talking about basically summarizing that the, um, there's no way to understand the ecology of the landscape without understanding the history. And Drew, you're, yeah, I'm gonna, you're, um, Drew, your internet connection is kind of frozen up again. So, Drew, are you back? I think, uh, yeah, we're we, 
Yeah, I'm still here. Your your um your connection is a is a little weak. It's been uh, locking up. Drew, I don't know if it would help if um, you. Yep. Okay, you're back now. Yep. Can you got you guys got me? Yeah, I got you. We're we're locked in now. So one one of the things that I want to help folks understand, and and part of how I lead bird walks is it they goes really slowly <laughs> and we we always talk about history always because it's part of this landscape so this blue gross beak that i think we're hey. drew it might help if you this turn your, gross beak we lost you drew it might help if you turn your camera off is one of the all right we'll try that is that any better that seems to be a little better i think it'll help just uh um just do do your sound and that that hopefully that'll make it a little smoother okay well um here we are um, back on the blue gross beak, which happens to be one of my favorite birds. But in thinking about what this blue gross beak represents historically, it represents open landscapes. It represents agrarian landscapes. If you want to see blue gross beaks now, you're going to go to pastures. You're going to go to old fields. You're going to go to those places that are kept open. So historically, that's where that bird would have been. So for me, it's impossible to separate history lessons from ornithological. Bird, though, we see the home farm. So we can go on to the next slide and about this this walk. There's a bird that many of you are familiar with, red-winged blackbirds, that are going to be around these fields, but also would have likely at some point in time have been more common, especially down near that ditch slash creek where we mm. saw Matt earlier. Again, sort of a bird of the wetlands, this avenue that we walk down on a, on a foggy spring morning, we're going to hear red-winged blackbirds, we're going to hear other migrants in the trees, he's wonder about, is what were people hearing in the past? What birds, what were the birds telling them about landscapes? And so along this row, our common but during migration, any birds might show. Here you see a hooded warbler. Again, another bird that's more likely to find an eastern screech owl. Another bird that we're going to find commonly along these areas where old witness trees exist. And so I want to stop here for a minute. And I want to spend a little bit of time on this owl. And here we see an eastern screech owl being rather sleepy in midday. And we say it's being sleepy. The bird is a sensitivity bird that would have been important in the lives of the enslaved and the lives of the people who lived on the land, because we've talked primarily about birds that were viewed positively so far, except for the red-tailed hawk. And now we're looking at a bird that across cultures, African, Asian, European, we're often looking at... Mm. Drew. We're, a the, bird the sound, yes the sound quality is pretty bad i'm gonna what i'm gonna do drew is i'm gonna call you 
Okay. And I'm going to put you on speakerphone, and I think that will help quite a bit. Okay, so sounds good. I'm giving you a call right now. All right. Hey, Drew. Hey, Matt. Okay, we're going to try um, this. So I'm going to mute your line. Oh, you muted it. Okay, great. So um, we'll, we'll, go, we'll keep on going now. Okay. So, so you should be able to see the screen, but I'm gonna, I've got my, the phone on speaker, and that'll be picked up by the microphone here on my end. Okay, sounds good. I guess after 78,000 Zoom meetings, eventually um, one had to go bad, right? Uh, absolutely, so, yeah. So I had a question. Someone asked, um, I think Kat asked about witness trees. What's a witness tree? A witness tree is um, typically an older or larger tree um, that we'll often, you'll often see in a landscape that we say has witnessed history. And so um, we're looking at an owl here at this eastern screech owl in an old broken off part of a tree. You can't see the remainder of this tree. And this isn't a, a tree at Montpelier, but there are many such trees um, that exist at Montpelier where there are screech owls, and I've heard screech owls there. Um, and so a witness tree, when you think of an old tree that's been in a yard for a very long time, or sometimes you'll see a tree standing alone out in the middle of a field, um, we often call those witness trees. And Matt, there are some historical precedents for witness trees, correct? Oh, yes, absolutely. We, we've, we've been able to tie some of these old growth trees two field lines that we know date back some 200 years. And this is where um, we're able to combine, you know, the, the information where you see out in the woods with um, the property lines that we, we, we've got recorded in the deeds, and then also be able to combine it when, with, when we know a certain area is open. So like that line, that double line of tulip poplars that you pointed out, Drew, that matches up with a, a deed of sale from the 1840s but we also have been able to figure out that line of tulip poplars mark the, marks the edge of one of the quarters as it was defined in the late 18th, early 19th century. And then we're actually able to date some of these, these trees with the field lines based on the age of the barns that goes back you know, to the early Federal Republic. So putting all these clues together, we're able to you know, use the tree lines that mark the old fields. And these fields were created by the enslaved community. Well, that's, that's one of the interesting things to me, Matt, about sort of you mentioned putting the puzzle pieces together and putting the puzzle pieces together, for example, for a tree, the age of a witness tree, where um, in some instances there are witness trees where people sign treaties. Um, and those trees, um, they, where they not only sign treaties, but where those treaties may have been broken um, or, or other things happen. But that line of witness trees, um, that legacy line in the forest is indicative of habitat that used to exist. And so in this next slide beyond the, the, the screech owl, you have a Kentucky warbler. And Kentucky warblers, we had a question earlier about some of the rarer species that might occur at Montpelier. This is a bird um, that occurs in the forest at Montpelier um, in migration, certainly, but I'm guessing um, that this bird is probably also nesting in the more music, in the moister portions of the forest. And it is a species that's going to take advantage of something that I saw a good bit when I was there the last time, Matt, mm. which was the result of large trees being, a large tree or two being blown down by a storm. And once those large trees, a large tree or two is blown down by a storm and creates what's called a wind throw, W-I-N-D-T-H-R-O-W, that wind throw creates a gap in the forest where emergent vegetation looking to make it toward the sunlight springs up. And that's where a Kentucky warbler wants to be. And this is a very fancy bird, a bird that's much sought after by bird watchers, but a bird that's more often heard than seen. 
sort of a touring, 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 touring call that's mm. reminiscent of a call that a Carolina wren would give. And so if you're ever in deep, deep forest and it seems just a bit odd that you're hearing Carolina wrens with a little more of a robust ring, there is a chance that it could be a Kentucky warbler. But Kentucky warblers would have likely been rarer birds around the time of enslavement and James Madison's Montpelier. The next bird on the slideshow is a black-throated blue warbler. And this, again, is a fairly common migrant across the Piedmont of, of Virginia, but a bird that typically likes to nest at elevation. And it is a warbler that spends a lot of time in mid-story and in understory. So when we look through this forest now, Matt, and we think about the vegetation, we think about what was and how open that landscape is, how it's closed in now, this is a bird that's more likely common on the Montpelier landscape now than it was historically. Now the next bird, the old name for this warbler is Firethroat. This is a Black Bernian warbler. And Black Bernian warblers love the canopy. And so most of what you're going to see of this bird is its belly and throat. Um, you're hardly ever going to get a downward look on this bird unless you're somewhere on the Blue Ridge Parkway. And we obviously aren't very far from the mountains. And I like to think about this bird passing through Montpelier on its way to higher elevations as that black-throated blue warbler would have been. Now, I want you to imagine people seeing these birds, these warblers, the black-throated green, the black burning and the next slide, which is a black, the black throated green warbler, which spends a little more time um, lower in um, in the in the forest strata, and then seeing a bird like this scarlet tanager, and um, as we stay on this scarlet tanager for a moment, this was a bird that I remember seeing, hearing first, actually, on our woods walk this time last year, Matt. Mm -hmm. And um, this was a bird that was singing its heart out, and I happened to catch it on its perch as we were looking at wildflowers, as we were talking about the warblers around us, and as we were talking about how dramatically the landscape had to have changed between enslavement at James Madison's Montpelier and the current time. This is a bird that would have been pretty uncommon at that time because although there would have been forests around, many of the forests would have been cleared for agriculture. And so one of the words that you'll frequently hear as we walk through forests that are tall and deep with big trees, even witness trees, people will use the word old growth. And there's very little old growth on this forest. Now, as we stop on this slide, I want you to see that that's not a bird there. It is a bird brain that's, <laughs> that's in that tree, but I'm sitting inside a tulip poplar, likely one of the witness trees that at Montpelier. And so when we think about that tree and we think about scarlet tanagers and cat, yes, we would also see summer tanagers there. Um, both tanagers likely nest at Montpelier. Here you see Matt near one of the barns. And Matt, this meadow has a little bit of a history to it as well, right? Yeah, this is the, um, the, the barn is called the Sheep Barn, and it's, it was built uh, in the early 20th century by DuPont, DuPont laborers, and we um, need, need to do some oral history on this because um, this, there, there, there are fields adjacent to this, but I, I guess this is where uh, the, 
sheep would have been overwintered uh, um, and then, you know, out, out in, the, uh, in some of the other pastures. But there's a, there's a complex history at Montpelier that is in the DuPont era that, you know, not only allowed preservation of all these sites, but there is also, you know, it's quite a, quite a farm complex here. It was more of a hobby farm that the DuPonts had, but it is some amazing buildings that are out across the landscape that were just, you know, beginning to, to really uh, to assess and um, understand how that, that period of the landscape was used as well. And that- Now, one, one, of, the, one of the things as we stood here, and, and actually I was um, lying on the ground as I took this picture of Matt, <laughs> was that I was hearing um, scarlet tanagers here, we were hearing oven birds here, mm. and as the forest has grown up around some of these openings, places that were kept open for various purposes, these are excellent birding spots. Um, and there's an opportunity to build a large list of birds on any walk at Montpelier. But I always encourage people on any walk with me to slow down, listen, get to know the landscape and the birds and why the birds might, in fact, choose to be in that place. Because part of what happens for a landscape like Montpelier is that we're ultimately going to have questions of conservation and preservation that come forward. Quite frankly, I think... Um, I think it's a little um, selfish to watch birds without thinking about watching other birds um, in, in coming mm. years. And so we have to conserve, we have to preserve areas. And so thinking about the patchwork quilt of a landscape that Montpelier is and all of the opportunities that it provides for birds, the sheep barn is just one of those places. I am absolutely enthralled with the whole idea of mapping history by birds and the opportunity to do so at places like this where you can pleasantly pause and listen to bird song is amazing at Montpelier. Next slide. Yeah, this this one, was this deeper in the East Woods, Drew? When, um... Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I took this picture um, in part um, to show, in, in, well, in part, it's just an interesting sort of um, tree ring where the roots have grown around. And I believe if I'm looking, um, I believe that's a trillium that might be coming up through. And so the time of year that we're in the woods for all of these migrating warblers are also great times um, to be wild, wildflower watching. And so as you think about watching warblers in the treetops, think about looking down. And as you look down and you see trillium, you're seeing plants that have taken advantage of that area not being under intense agriculture for a long time. You have to think about, again, the soil that you stand on in order to understand the birds that you're seeing. And that soil that we are standing on, much of it had eroded, right, Matt? Yeah, there was there was quite a bit of erosion. This I, I remember exactly where this is, Drew. This is a a tree that the roots are completely exposed, where it's a it's an old growth uh, tulip poplar that what grew around an earlier tree. It might have been it's probably a um, either a uh, an oak tree or might have been a cedar, um, and then that cedar or oak tree died. And it left this hollow, but the roots of this tulip poplar, which is an old growth tree in and of itself, it, you know, dates back to when erosion was occurring. That would only occur with agriculture. Um, that's why all those roots are exposed. And uh, really, the the when we've done testing out in the woods, um, all the areas where you have slopes, you've got a severely reduced amount of topsoil. But these the bottomlands uh, where this is close to you've got an incre these incredible deposits of silts that have created these really today very rich biological environments where you've got a lot of recovery and, um, and renewal with, with some of these uh, flora that, that's out there today. It seems like it's like for land, the landscape at Montpelier where we, um, where the, the crop fields were abandoned say about a hundred years ago, you don't have the diversity 
of compared to those areas that were abandoned about 160 years ago. So you can really clock how long it takes these woodlands to recover, which is quite a way, quite, quite a long time. And it's where, you know, we've got this, you know, not only an archaeological laboratory out here, but a bio, you know, a, an ecological laboratory to really look at recovery of, of landscape. Well, that's, that's one of the things, Matt, that's, that's thrilling to me. Um, in, in that this place, um, and looking at this, this witness tree and thinking about the soils and thinking about the birds um, that were there. And, and one of the things that we talk about as we walk is as we look at the landscape as it exists now and we try to predict what birds are going to be there. So this, even just this, <laughs> this picture alone reminds me of the oven birds that we were hearing everywhere in the, wood, in the woods um, on, on that day. And ecologists, foresters will use, forest ecologists will use the word music, um, which means moist. And so many of these forests mm -hmm. are moist forests in that they support relatively humid conditions. Um, there's a good bit of leaf litter. Um, they appear to be rich forests. Um, the soil is probably nearer um, neutral um, than um, areas that might be more exposed, which means that there is going to be a different flora that grows there, which means it's going to attract different kinds of birds. And so all of that, man, all of those puzzle pieces fit together in the present, but then we look behind us and you think about how much of the south, the southern Piedmont soil had eroded and what it meant for the land. So Matt mentioned the word recovery, and that's important. And nature um, gives us an opportunity to think about recovery. It gives us an opportunity to think about repair and re reparations. It gives us an opportunity to think about ecological resilience. It gives us an opportunity to think about environmental and social justice, all in a bird walk, which I think Matt, it's kind of different for bird walk. Yeah, it, it's it's something I, I feel like, um, you know, what what we get out of the um, uh, of this untouched environment here at Montpelier is nature has had time to recover. It's it's claimed its wounds from everything from eroded slopes to uh, silted in streams. And it's it's adapted. It hasn't tried to, to deny any of the history that's there. It, it deals with it. And that's something exactly. that we, you know, we can learn from. At the, and in the same way that we can be enthralled by the nature that's out here, we really need to be enthralled with how nature, you know, takes takes on takes on its history directly and how it is able to recover. And that's something to learn from for our own country. I mean, there's there. I think where you get in, where we we've got into into problems as a society is trying to deny some of that some of that history, and um, really it's uh, just letting letting this this history wash over us and really claiming it is where um, uh, we're able to take the beauty that's here and like all the species you've been talking about, Drew, which I just I've been writing like mad because I wanted to learn all these these various birds and what they what their habitats are and what the, it reflects of how the land is used, how, how they use the land today and how it reflects of how the land was used uh, uh, some some years ago. And what it, what it what's really amazing is like the you've got the the woods that are out there here at Montpelier, but you've got so many of these buildings. So I'm looking above my laptop at the um, at this collection of Dupont buildings. This is a shot you took of the schooling barn, and this is uh -huh. a, it's a swallow coming out of there, isn't it? Yeah, it's a barn swallow, which again would have been a bird um, likely common. Um, during Madison's time. I mean, this is a bird, when we think about barn swallows, uh, even the name, I mean, here's hmm. a bird that we're associating with human built habitation. Um, we're not, we're not calling it, um, you know, arch swallow um, hmm. or natural monument swallow. Nope, that is not a barn owl. That is actually a barn swallow. 
And so this this barn swallow that that's there has has likely, and I like to think about generations, um, not only of people but of birds and of trees and of life. And this is the bird um, who who could be a descendant of hundreds of generations of barn swallows, because again when you think about how long humans have been on the landscape and how long and barn swallows go with agriculture like rows with crops and so this is a bird that um was coming out of this barn had a nest in the barn um as a matter of fact there was likely um likely a, a small colony almost of them around but this picture is symbolic to me because this is the bird taking advantage of an opportunity um, to be free um, mm. of a bird taking advantage of the environment around it and a bird that has somehow been persistent enough to thrive um, around um, in, in spite of all that, that we've done to the environment and in fact has taken advantage of it. So, um, yeah, this barn swallow, um, and this picture was emblematic, and I remember that day very well as we were coming back, um, coming back from our woods walk, Matt. Yeah, the, these these guys have just about uh, passed. They've shed their uh, their hoods out in the wood uh, today. Jack in the pulpit, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, again, you're looking at a flower. Um, when I think about um, spring ephemerals, when I look at Jack in the pulpit, again, I am thinking um, of about, I'm thinking of a number of birds, but I most closely associate Jack in the pulpit with oven birds. That teacher, 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 teacher. Hmm. That call that we hear ringing in the woods, um, that's Robert Frost's midwood bird, right? Um, but I see Jack in the pulpit, and where I see Jack in the pulpit, I'm also likely to hear oven birds. So the vegetative associations are important for understanding the birds that might be there because this, again, is not a flower um, that you're going to buy, find in Zurich, another word for dry situations. It's not one that you're going to find um, in wetland situations, typically. Um, it's going to be one that you find in well-developed um, organic layers of soil. And so this, co this next picture, this colonnade of trees, look at that. What is that saying? My goodness. <laughs> um, gigantic tulip poplars, a relatively well-developed mid-story. This is one of my favorite portions of the forest because not only am I hearing oven birds there, I'm hearing scarlet and summer tanagers there, cat. I'm also hearing black-throated green warblers there, and I'm hearing wood thrush in this forest. But you're also looking at a forest map that probably wasn't always forest, correct? Yeah, this this is uh, right in the middle of that line of tulip poplars, and it's um, there on the side that you've taken this picture. Uh, up until the 1930s was an open pasture and based on what we found with the archaeology with some of the barns we found it was probably in a, a, a worked agricultural field up until about the time of slavery then it was used as pasture after that and then in 1930s and 40s was, is when it started to close in with forests but between you can see in this photo you've got the uh, um the skyline up above that's the top of the ridge all that up to where there's a field where that where you can start to see the sky that closed in in forest uh sometime in the 1840s and so you get you get two different zones of uh of woodland in this area and um drew what 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 is the history of an oven bird why is it, would it um nest in chimneys or what what why is it called the oven bird no, an, an oven bird, um, and I, I think I might have a picture of it later, but an oven bird is a, a small warbler, um, about uh, four inches, four and a half inches long, weighs about as much as um, a palm full of paper clips, 
um, looks almost like a small brush. So brown backed and with sort of a streaky spotted chest, mm. but it has an orange stripe down the middle of its head. And it, um, it's a neotropical migrant, which means that it winters, it spends its winters, the fall and winter in the Caribbean and Central America, a little bit of Northern South America. And then that, it makes this epic journey. Some of those birds come up the Florida Peninsula. Uh, many of those birds, though, are flying 600 miles nonstop hmm. across the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> Excuse me. And so when that bird gets here, it's looking to set up breeding territories and forests like the one we just saw. Oven birds are called oven birds because they build their nests on the ground mm -hmm. and they're very very hard to find they look like old dutch ovens and they're covered over oh They'll my goodness often, and, mm. and get this people will sometimes find those nests nestled among ferns and fiddleheads and jack in the pulpits so it's it's really i like to call it um the warb the, the 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 fairy of the warbler world <laughs> because they live in these almost mystical sorts of settings, but we will only have oven birds in the spring and summer. And it's a loud ringing call, a teacher, 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 teacher. And this crescendoing call song that you'll hear in just a spot like this, Matt, I would be willing to bet money <laughs> that if I walk to this spot today, that within um, five, ten minutes, I'm going to hear an oven bird. And I'm going to hear multiple oven birds. And oven birds are one way that I use as, uh, as an ecologist to judge the health of a forest. Hmm. And it tells me that this forest is healthy in ways that um, that many forests aren't, which make it very important. So this is a special spot to me, as you can hear, um, because I, every time I've been there, whether winter, spring, summer, or fall, and you can imagine the glory of it in the fall, um, it just speaks to me. And I, I think um, there's also something going on with the spirit of this place, if you don't mind me saying that, and that there were people bound and working this landscape and so i can't untie that from this picture <laughs> and um and matt can you tell us a little bit about this place yeah this is this is a close-up of a uh you can see the orange that is that is not natural uh drew, drew and i placed that there this is in the middle of a chimney mound from a slave quarter that's in the middle of the woodlot that's in this this last picture that i just brought up in the screen but what, um, what grew up in the, in the middle of this chimney pile, this fall of rock and uh, brick, is a locust tree, a black locust tree. And black locusts generally uh, only grow up in, op along the edges of fields or, um, uh, or in, in where, where it can grow in the open sunshine. This black locust tree took over this chimney after the structure was abandoned and grew up. Later on, that black locust was cut probably about 60 years ago. And it left this stump that is about chest high, which is typical of how timbers back in the early 20th century, late 19th century would cut trees. If you're cutting a tree with an ax, you're not going to, or, or with the, or the saw blade, you're not going to cut it down at the base because that'd be incredibly hard to do. You can do that with a chainsaw, but not with an ax. And so you get these, these stumps that are much higher and being black locust, that stump has persisted. I'll send out a, um, a, uh, um, a presentation I've got that shows uh, to all the participants what this tree looked like, but it's it really marks this this slave quarter this 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 home for for an enslaved family um, that uh, probably left there around 1863 when they um, left for freedom, perhaps heading up to a Union lines up in Culpeper. But um, today, this is a uh, you know one of these incredible environments that's in, that has so much in the way of diversity of flora and fauna that's been allowed to recover, been left to its own devices to, um, to heal its wounds in so many ways. 
And this is so this is right right down the slope from this this little toad friend we found. <laughs> yeah, that that again, um, I, you know, one of the things one of one of my pet peeves is um, sort of when we're out watching birds, and and I've I've literally watched people step on salamanders and things because um, there's so much to see out there if we take our time. Um, cultural sites, um, beautiful um, other creatures like. Um, like this, this, this young toad um, that's there. I'm, I'm thinking. Uh, why am I thinking fowl or I? Um, one of my herpetologist friends might correct me there. I'm trying to remember about parotid glands on the back of this toad's head. So I'm back in school. <laughs> but um, in, in thinking uh, about the landscape and where um, that that slave quarter was and the birds. Um, that I heard there, it was a completely different set of birds than people would have heard who had been living in that house. The people mm. who had been living in that house would have been hearing open country birds like the red-winged blackbird, like the goldfinch. They would have been seeing red-tailed hawks. They, in all likelihood, would not have been hearing um, things like wood thrush or things like oven birds because, again, you know, this forest has reclaimed um, the land in part through ecological succession. And so when we think about those birds, when we think about the, the other creatures that are there, I want us to always be cognizant, not just of the present, which is obviously very important for several reasons, but also to think about how the land got to be what it is, but then to think about how we conserve and preserve what we have so that creatures like the toad will continue to have homes. And this one, you know, to talk about uh, the progression of history on the landscape, this is uh, a, a 36 Plymouth that has been out in these woods probably since it was abandoned there sometime in the 1960s. Uh, in fact, I remember uh, there's a, a gentleman who used to work here, Buck Smith. He was in his 90s when I knew him about uh, 15 years ago. He 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 told he 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 and I were both old car lovers as you are Drew because you told me your I think your uncle had what a thirty six Plymouth. Um, yeah, my 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 uh, father. Oh, your father did. Plymouth. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. We, we were walking through the woods and I told Drew it was like it was a it was it was off the path and I was like there's a thirty six Plymouth over there would you be interested and he whipped around and said what so we went over <laughs> and looked at it and I got his picture on this so. And there were oven birds all over the place here. I heard mm. wood thrush here. Um, I also heard, again, summer tanager. The woods were just full of summer tanager. I mean, not uh, scarlet tanager actually here that day. Um, and there's a chip burr, chip burr, chip burr. And great crested flycatcher. So this is a bird. Um, this next slide is past the 36 plummet. Is, is a great crested flycatcher, which is a bird that likely would have been more common, um, at least as common as um, some of the, the more open country birds, because it's a bird that tends to like groves. Now, mm. so we talked about open fields, we talked about forests, now we're going to talk a little bit about, just for a minute, about groves. What's a grove? Well, a grove is, is um, essentially a woodland. That is, think of a fruit orchard where you've got widely interspersed trees um, with little else, maybe grass underneath. That's what a grove is. And great crested flycatchers, again, are neotropical migrants. This is a bird that's only with us during the spring and summer, has this very distinctive weep, 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 weep. And Matt, I'm not sure how my imitation bird calls are coming through. On, <laughs> They're coming through fine, the, Drew. <laughs> on the phone. But um, it's also a flycatcher that nests in cavities. And it nests in cavities, that is, holes that have been um, excavated by woodpeckers. So the technical mm. term for a great crested flycatcher is it's a secondary cavity user. It's not an excavator. Its bill is not strong enough to chisel mm. away at, um, at, at even rotten wood. But it's a bird that's pretty common along the edges of woods and in groves. So it's a bird that you can see readily at Montpelier. 
Um, and likely a, a migrant that was also um, also common um, back during Madison's time. No. So let's stick here for a minute. Okay. Because this um, is a bird that um, some of you might recognize. Uh, many of you may think it's a morning dove, and, and the bird on your right looks a lot like a morning dove. This is a passenger pigeon. This is a pair of passenger pigeons. And this is a bird that likely drove through the, the southern Piedmont um, during the time of Madison. And with a little bit of the, um, the, um, the archaeological zoology, the zoological archaeology that's been done, perhaps, perhaps, and I'm, and I'm going out a little on a limb here, a bird whose bones may be buried in the soil um, because this was an important food resource. And it was an important food resource because we see a pair of the birds here um, but this, at one point in time, was one of the most abundant birds on Earth, a bird that numbered in the billions, a bird that was so abundant that um, Native Americans would use um, branches and long um, bamboo canes, switch canes, to just take them out of the air. Um, hmm. When people came along, when settlers came along with shotguns, they began to lay waste to them. They were at one time so common, so abundant, so easy to kill that people would kill thousands, tens of thousands in a day, take what they wanted, and then turn their swine herd in on the remaining dead birds for those swine to feed on them. A bird so common that it provided food resources for growing cities like New York and Chicago. Um, a bird where we got the term stool pigeon because one of the ways to lure flocks in was to have a captured bird and to tie it to a stool as a decoy. A bird, again, whose bones may represent in some of the archaeological work, at least we know that there were pigeons that were being eaten, um, and a bird that likely was passing through, passenger pigeons passing through Montpelier. So when you think about that landscape, when you think about what was, when you think about not just the birds being there and to themselves, but how did people use birds? And we know that enslaved peoples were having to forage, were out having to find, um, they were hunting and gathering. And, and not in, in a way for pleasure, but in a way to survive, right, Matt? Yeah, absolutely. It's um, a lot of the, the the bird bones typically don't survive as well um, in uh, the open trash deposits we've got because they're they're hollow. A lot of times the bird bones would be easily um, easily masticated or crushed during the meal. Uh, so you don't tend to find that they're, they're underrepresented compared to bones such as from uh, from uh, pigs where you've got very robust, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, hard bone fragments that, that will survive. But they, where we've got intact deposits, such as ash deposits, you tend to find some of these, these, uh, these birds. It's something, something that uh, uh, would love to find another way to, um, to, as an indice for the presence of these birds. Because uh, what you're talking about with the amount of birds that were here, what, for these passenger pigeons, what would they have been um, eating? Uh, insects or? No, I, and so here's the other thing that we've got to think about. And um, so in forests around Montpelier, the forest patches that would have existed, this is a bird that was heavily associated with American chestnut. Um, oh my goodness. And, mm. and so when we think about central range of American chestnut, uh, the Virginia Piedmont was right there, correct? Yeah, um, this the the chestnut was the dominant tree uh, uh, during this time period. Yes. So this is a this is a bird that um, that it, you know when we do a little bit of puzzling together, that almost certainly had, and it wasn't every year that the great fox came through. Mm. Scientists used to think that it was a yearly thing, but they were sort of episodic. 
in some years it just might be a few hundred or thousand birds that came through and then maybe every third or fifth year just uncountable numbers of birds that um that in all likelihood people would have to stop work for um to go and take advantage of the harvest because not only were people killing the adults um the squab were considered and are considered squab of pigeons in general are considered hmm. delicacies and those are the young birds still in the nests so you would have had um this great bounty of food and the way that people preserved um, these birds was that they would have um, pickled them um, or salted them down or smoked them so that they could have um, had them beyond um, you know that fresh meat and so uh, yeah these are birds that took great advantage of um, chestnut crops um, which was a pretty persistent crop and also probably acorns and other mast that is nuts and berries um, that would have been ripening um, in, the, in the woods. So mm. it's a bird that's no longer with us. The last passenger pigeon, a female, um, that looks like that would have looked like the bird on the right. Her name was Martha, and Martha died in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. So wow. we went from one of the most abundant birds in the world to one to none. So that's something else to think about. You know, and that, that question of history and why is history important? It's important because we don't want to repeat the sins of the past, whether extinction by um, by causing animals to, to wink out of existence or enslavement to threaten the freedom of others. Yeah, and the, what we've got here at Montpelier is a chance to really um preserve some of these uh um these these uh, ecological n n niches and here you've got this is the field right outside of the uh, the east woods where you've got a um an old fence line from the dupont period uh with these concrete fence posts and trees growing up along it most of these are uh looks like there's a number of uh um walnut trees that are here and this is where you we saw all, all those um the, the raptors it was a raptor party yeah. up in the air so yeah, this is this field was where we were coming out of the woods after, I don't know, it, it, it felt like we had been in there only a few minutes, but I think we had been in those woods for two or three hours. Mm -hmm. and, and we came out, and and, um, and there were um, lots of turkey vultures, a few black vultures um, that were, were circling, and a red-tailed hawk um, that we saw earlier in a picture, remember, and that red-tailed hawk came over, circled, and called. Remember that, Matt? Yeah, yeah, that was amazing. It's like it was set up for for the uh, for the walk. <laughs> well, I don't know how much you and Cat paid that hawk, but um, <laughs> it showed up right right on time. This is a bird that that almost everyone should know. This is a female eastern bluebird, and so um, that female eastern bluebird um, is was likely on a coming. Well, she was coming actually out of a nest box when um, I took this picture of her down here in South Carolina. But this is a bird that's probably more common now than it was at the time of, of, mm. of James Madison, in part because people um, like bluebirds and they put up houses for them, which they readily take to. And so it's been a conservation success story. But this is a bird that was in great decline because of the disappearance of natural cavities. And as, mm. I mean, because people didn't have any use, really, didn't think about wildlife using dead and dying trees. Um, the technical name for dead and dying trees are snags, mm. um, S-N-A-G-S. And so that bluebird is, when I see a bluebird, I think of conservation success at the hands of human beings. So. There are great things that we can do for wildlife that make a difference. And what I love about those those snags, those remnants of trees in the in the forest, Drew, is they also have given us a lot of information about the history of how the land has changed. Like, we're a we're you're you've got a graduate student who's starting to look at some of these um, these remnant trees. And what I've got often wonder is there there when when we were down in that lowland where I was talking about that uh, agricultural ditch, we started heading up slope and there is a, um, uh, a, a 
part of the wood lot that was all tulip poplar, but it was covered in um, uh, uh, um, fallen pine trees that were rotten. And, and so it's similar to the, the, this is, this is not a, this is, yeah, this is one of these pine trees out in the middle of the woods where, where you yep. get these um, millipedes, but the, um, but where you have these fallen pine trees, it seems that um, you only get collections of pine trees where you've had a field that's been immediately abandoned after it's been plowed and been worked rather than being in pasture for a period of 20 or 30 years. So with having these areas preserved and not timbered, but allowed to you know, basically keep their remnant um, uh, tree cavities and, and tree carcasses in place, we can be begin to reconstruct some of the history. And I'm not absolutely certain that the pine trees only grew up in areas that are, that have, that were recently plowed, but it seems to be a pattern that you know we'd love to establish through some scientific observations and doing some archaeological survey as well. Well, Matt, one of the one of the names for um, some of the, the pines that come up are called old field pines, and mm. um, and I believe that might be the the, the old name for loblolly or short leaf pine, but. Um, you know you're 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 pretty spot on there and again as we walk through these landscapes and as we're watching birds it's amazing to me when we take our binoculars down just for a little bit and we look at the patterns um we can begin to understand the land and we begin to understand why the birds might be where they are but we might also begin to understand why the birds aren't in places that they think we think they might be and that's, man, that's part of the great detective story of being a scientist, of being a, a naturalist, um, of just being a noticer, of being able to, to sort of puzzle things together. Sometimes it's seeing a track um, mm -hmm. somewhere. Um, sometimes it's, it's seeing eggs in a pool. Um, sometimes it's finding remnants of a nest in the wintertime that tells you a bird wanted to be there. Sometimes it's finding things like this tiger swallowtail um, that was uh, a pretty amazing story. Um, and, 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 that is, and that is something that, um, I don't know, to watch someone um, really care for this, this butterfly that day was important to us. So I had a question, Matt, quickly about um, red-headed woodpeckers. So red-headed woodpeckers, I'm going to go back to a bird that we had a while back, Cat, and that was the great crested flycatcher. And great crested flycatchers and red-headed woodpeckers are sort of complementary birds. And I say that in that not that, well, actually great crested flycatchers will often nest in cavities that red-headed woodpeckers have excavated. But red-headed woodpeckers who have this pretty unique call, a queer, 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 and then a rattle, they will excavate cavities that great crested flycatchers use. Red-headed woodpeckers, which have been in a pretty dramatic decline across most of their range, um, are making somewhat of a comeback. They're doing better in some places now. But they are also grove birds. They're birds that like open woodlands um, with lots of hardwoods, especially acorns. And um, red-headed woodpeckers belong to a group of birds, the Melanerpes woodpeckers, which includes uh, red-bellied woodpeckers mm. here in the east, and then out west includes a really handsome woodpecker called an acorn woodpecker. But they will actually store acorns in granaries. That is, they'll drill mm. little holes in dead wood, and then they'll put the acorns in there. Um, and red-headed woodpeckers do that um, a lot less than acorn woodpeckers do. Acorn woodpeckers are famous for having these generations-old granaries. But red-headed woodpeckers, which are really handsome, fully red-head, not part of the head on adults, but a fully red-head and this really handsome tuxedo plumage. So white underneath, black on the back, um, with um, sort of what I like to call um, white handkerchief or pocket squares on the wings. So a red-headed woodpecker is about as snazzy as it gets for a woodpecker, unless, of course, they're hammering on your downspout <laughs> at, 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 at 5.30 a.m., and then they're a little less um, dramatic. 
<laughs> so this is a bird I have on the slide because it is, is a bird that is really sort of in the east, um, sort of a, an episodic representation of grasses. Remember, we started at places like this. That next slide is, is really a good segue for this bird because this is a dick thistle. And dick thistles are birds that in they're, they're so episodic in the ways that they show up that you would probably have a hard time finding records of dick thistles, um, or maybe not, I'm thinking, um, finding records of dick thistles from um, the time of Madison because we have to think about the, the relative proximity of prairie back then, which would have been much closer. So this is a bird that very well could have shown up. They may breed in an area for four, five, six years, and then they'll disappear. And they'll disappear um, when, um, when succession begins to take over, um, when forests begin to regenerate in old fields, then dick thistles will leave. But this, again, is one of those migrants that will fly all the way down. And this is a bird that winters in Argentina. Hmm. So it's a bird that, when it shows up, is bringing a bit of a pompous to us. Um, but it's a bird that's also heavily persecuted on its migratory route and on the wintering grounds. Um, tens of thousands of them are killed as pests because they will descend on crop fields. And so um, people trying to control them will go out and spray over them with poisons mm. um, and, and really lay waste to them. So the birds that survive, um, to me, are, are heroic. And so I think um, it's a bird that um, I fully expect, if it hasn't already shown up at Montpelier um, in recent years, to show up as those places, those grasslands, are managed um, in the right way. Yeah, the, the, some of the journeys you've described of these birds, Drew, it, it just, it's amazing how, how resilient birds are to survive all the impediments that have been thrown up against them. It's, uh, uh, it, there's, there's got to be, there's, I'm sure you know, there's analogies for this that, you know, are, 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 are learning, learning um, points of learning for us to take into consideration. Well, Matt, I, you know, this is another one of those spots at Montpelier where you stop to listen to birds. You're at what we call, um, you know, this, this ecotone, right? Um, and, and you're at this edge of field and forest and, and hedgerow, and it's a really rich place. You can hear all kinds of birds here. You look up and you see raptors, and then you can look off towards um, the Blue Ridge there, and... Um, and that's one of the things for me, quite frankly, in this time of, um, of the pandemic and all the mm. things that are going on in the world that aren't right, um, that, that can bring us down. Birds um, have a way of at least sort of salving the pain a little bit. Because birds um, to, to human beings have always represented um, some sort of freedom. They've at least represented a being that humans wanted to attain. And so they seem to defy the bounds that would bind humans to earth. Birds could fly um, or can fly, humans on the ground, um, run as fast as you can, you can't fly, flap your arms as hard as you can, you're not hmm. going to, to suddenly take off. Trust me, I've tried it. <laughs> but in that, in seeing birds, I like to imagine that even as people were along this, um, this landscape, were in this landscape, their backs bent to the sky, um, working hard, not for themselves, but at the behest of being owned by somebody else, that they might hear a bird sing and try to whistle its tune because it pleased their ears that they might look up and see a swallow joyously flying and for a moment wonder what it would be like to have that freedom to come and go mm. as you wish. Um, that they looked forward to those years when the passenger pigeons would come through in abundance because that meant more food for them. That birds meant something more to humans than just other beings, that they were inspiration. So 
that's how I like for us to watch birds as we walk these fifty miles. That down by the home farm, right? Yeah, you this know? is yeah, this is right uh, the next ridge over from the uh, field below the visitor center. It's it's the home farm. And and that you know, I look at that place, and it's personal to me, Matt, because my ancestor from the Mid Atlantic came south from somewhere around what's now Atlanta, Maryland, in about 1790. And mm. 1790 was one of those periods when people were being sold off. Yeah, it's a for Montpelier. It was a relatively um, a stable period for the for the for the community because. Uh, you had the transition from James Madison Sr. to James Madison Jr., who was the future president at that time in the 1790s. But because the the plantation was real, had it, was diversified by Madison's father uh, to include blacksmithing, uh, um, jobbing of slaves, that um, the community was not sold during that time period. Like a lot of other plantations are being broken up, but. Um, they, the enslaved community had another about 20 or 30 years before that started to happen. So Montpelier was a little bit unusual in that area. Because it, yeah, it, it, it's, it's when you think about this landscape, when I think about the birds that were there, when I think about the people that were there, um, it all just comes together to me in that landscape in, in, a, in a very real way. And so... Um, you know, whatever the power your binoculars might be, um, you know, you can see much further sometimes when you take those binoculars down, and it allows you, in some ways, to see through to see through time. Mm -hmm. So these are just some scenes as we go through and there. So we stop right there, and guess what? Um, there's that bluebird, that blue crow speak, that we saw in the beginning, right? Right along that fence road. And um, and that was taken, actually, as we were walking down, um, down that line um, underneath some of the black walnut. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we were talking about the cultural importance of black walnut. Um, a lot of us love black walnut cake, and um, I love black walnut ice cream, which is like, rare as hints to find <laughs> these days. But people were using that black walnut um, in all sorts of ways, including to secure fish dinners, probably. So, um, but we look at this blue grosbeak, beak and you look at a bird again that could be representing generations and generations upon generations of birds that have existed on the James Madison landscape. Yeah, and that really, this is a shot of the uh, Madison Family Cemetery. And um, it's uh, the generations of Madisons and the enslaved community, of course, ended. And there, here's a shot of the, of the slave cemetery. But the, the bird legacy and these natural legacies do continue on, Drew. It's pretty, um, pretty amazing to think of th these, these birds that we see today, how you know, their ancestors could have been visiting here Mont, you know, at Montpelier in, in witnessing the, um, the history that we're talking about. Um, well, the, you know, Matt, that's the, you know, the, the inspiration that I was talking about in part that birds give is that, that, um, that given a chance, life goes on. Um, and, and so what does that chance for birds mean? It means that we think about conserving and preserving, really, landscapes like Montpelier that um, we try, we let nature take its course, but we don't short circuit nature by doing things like, um, like timbering um, where, where we shouldn't, mm -hmm. that, that we allow witness trees to continue to bear witness to time and to the movement of the seasons and to let um, scarlet tanagers and the warblers, the waves of warblers drift through their branches that we don't cover up the history, um, that we live within it and understand um, how to do better by our, by our fellow human beings and by our fellow feathered beings going forward. And so I think Montpelier is one of those places, for me, that's an exemplar of, um, 
of, of how nature can restore us if we give nature a chance to restore itself. And that, um, you know, as I've watched your work and your passion there um, in the soil and, um, and walk through the woods with you, um, I, I look forward to that time when we can um, not have to deal with technical issues like Zoom and, and, um, <laughs> and, and, and we can be back on the ground I'm listening to these beautiful birds, watching them, um, and contemplating the the history that all of it exists with them. Yeah, we definitely am looking. We're looking forward to that. We um, we have a uh, a new president here at Montpelier uh, who who su- succeeded uh, Kat and her work, her wonderful work, uh, Roy Young, and he is very interested in building off of. The, the work that's happened over the past five or six years, especially with a partnership we, we've got with you, um, Drew, and doing everything from um, uh, bio blitzes to inventorying what we've got here at Montpelier to really understand it. Because a lot of what we've got right now, you know, good analogy is the birds. It's, it's um, uh, a little anecdotal. It's, we haven't done really an exhaustive and scientific study of what's here, but you know, we need to do this for the archaeology, and we also need to do it with the with the ecological habitats that are here. And um, we might discover that uh, that areas that we didn't really think of have some real gems that are there. And I think the the East Woods really exemplify that. That's where that's where we're going to be walking today is in the East Woods um, with, uh, with with this bird tour. And, and what I'm hoping we can do, Drew, in the near future, and this is for every, all the attendees, um, is have more uh, hands-on participatory programs where we're collecting data, you know, teaching people how to observe, how to look at these habitats, both fields and woods, to see where, you know, this, uh, where, where the animals are, where, where the flora are, and start, start to uh, create a league of citizen scientists to go out there and record all this. And I'm- Absolutely, Matt. And, I, um, and, 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 and due diligence, there, there were a couple of questions that I wanted to answer. Yeah. Or um, attempt to answer. Well, someone, uh, Ben um, S., asked about um, Dolly Madison's parrot, Holly, and, um, and and I think I know where Ben might be headed. Um, was it a Carolina parakeet? Who knows? Mm. Um, no, it was. That was Carolina parakeets were um, uh, were were fancied by by many people as companion birds as pets. And so I've had that thought in my mind as well. And as a um, creative nonfiction writer. Um, I've thought about taking the liberty of in some of my writings of making that a Carolina parakeet. Um, so, um, but I don't know, Matt, if we have really any record of how that parakeet looked, do we? We we don't. I think the um, uh, the evidence we've got is that we. Uh, is I, I will I, I've got some um, some information that I looked up the last time on this and I'll send it to everybody. I'm going to send a follow up email to all the participants and we'll um, find out exactly what it was. It was captured by it was put outside in the in the, at dusk and it was um, uh, taken away by a raptor. So yeah, it yeah. ended its life quite dramatically and it might have been it, it's. Had had some uh, somewhat nasty habits that were reported, so it might have reached the end of its tolerance with the uh, <laughs> the enslaved community, and somebody might have been like, "Well, we'll just leave it out here. I see somebody up above there circling. Let's let's see what happens with Polly when we leave her out there on the stoop here." So, <laughs> well, and Elizabeth Brantley asked, "Would Montpelier ever consider a dedicated wildflower meadow for birds and other pollinators?" That's a great question. Yeah, we we have a meadow that we opened up in what was called the uh, mountain field, and certainly a, a lot of that um, takes some uh, pretty intense management. And that's where uh, we're, we would what we really want to do, Drew. And this is something that you're we've talked a lot about is is getting um, developing intern programs where we have projects that graduate students can be working on such as creating a pollinator meadow and 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 creating using the spaces we've got here to not only increase some of the diversity of of habitats that are here but also provide opportunities with visitors access to see some of this so 
ideas like that. This is this is the kind of the kind of discussions that we have during these participatory programs where people come for three days or, or for a week, learn about what we've got. We've got one uh, gentleman, uh, Dean, who just uh, uh, thanked us for being on the, for giving this program. He's Dean has come on about um, uh, ten programs and just the the ideas we're able to share and potential ways to expand what Montpelier has to offer is some of the more valuable parts of uh, of this. And uh, looks like you're trying to to come back come back through with the um, on on the line. Um, things off if it's too bad, but I just wanted to tell people, um, I wanted to thank, I know we're near the end of our time, I think. Yeah, we are. It's 3.30. And it, see see if anyone has any um, uh, questions. Oh, here we go. Pat, Pat, Patrick came through. Polly was a macaw. That's what Polly uh, was. Okay. okay. And there's a whole slew of questions. Elizabeth Smith asked, do you have any professional development programs for teachers, even out of state? Absolutely. We're, we've got um, online um uh, media that we're developing now, but we have, when we're back in session after COVID, we've got archaeology programs that are specifically designed for teachers. We've got, um, with the Constitution Center, training programs for um, curriculum development with teachers. Um, and uh, Rhonda asked, hoping the kids bug walk on June 13th will be live. Yes, that will, that will be live as well. Um, and what else? Uh, what was the last little bird before the before the gross beak? Um, and that was Drew. It's it's. Do you know what the bird was that had the red head and the black face? A little tiny bird. Uh, I'm trying to think back to my slides. I know all the birds on the slides. I'm just trying to go back and think. Um, I'm going to share screens again. Let me see if I can get back. Yeah, to... share, share the screen, and I'll tell you immediately what. Um, what it is. If it this was the little first guy. Blue bird speak, um, there, well, we didn't get to that bird, but that is a bay breasted warbler. Yeah, I skipped over it pretty quick. I was going to one of the other, other slides. Now, so. the bird, now, there was a bird, and someone um, helped out before the, I think it was before the last blue bird speak with the Dixon. This guy? Drew, are you still there? Yep. No, okay. We didn't. That's a that's a bay-breasted warbler right here. We didn't bay get to that. We didn't get to that but, one. Okay. But, but that's that's a bay-breasted warbler, um, and and that's a that's a, a much sought-after warbler that is coming through the Piedmont of um, Virginia. Um, about well, about now, the last the last uh, flocks of them are, are coming through about now. So get out, look up, and you might uh, get lucky enough to see bay-breasted warblers. Really high-pitched calls. Well, Drew, this has been absolutely wonderful. Really appreciate uh, uh, you you joining us with it and, and doing this uh, this virtual bird walk. Well, I'm, I'm, I, I would much rather do real bird walks, but anytime I get a chance to commune with you and, and uh, kindred spirits, Matt, it's a, it's a great opportunity. So, um, I look forward to um, being beyond COVID <laughs> and, yes. uh, and, and being able to get out on the ground with this, uh, with this work. And I'm hoping that people are going to take our, our, uh, our other classes that we're going to be offering soon. So I look forward to that. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Kat. Yeah, thank, thank you, Drew. And thank you to everyone who took part today. Um, we've got your all's emails. And if you're, I'll, I'll send an email at after out afterwards if you're interested in being on some of our mailing lists for the programs that we we're going to be offering uh give you that give you that opportunity but thank you so much for uh, joining us today and uh, we'll we'll keep you all um in the in the loop about future programs that we have coming up so thank you again drew you're welcome take care everybody be safe bye everybody <laughs>